Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Laura Fuller, a Communications Officer with the UNEP Enlighten Initiative, and welcome to today's webinar. Our feature presentations are focused on the Enlighten Initiative and the section of the Efficient Lighting Toolkit that deals specifically with the monitoring, verification, and enforcement of lighting products. And this is section four, which is entitled Ensuring Product Availability and Conformance. We're fortunate to have two expert panelists representing the United Nations Environment Program and the Australian Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency presenting on this topic today. So before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You can either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane on the right-hand side of the screen. By doing so, we'll eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. Only the presenters will be able to talk during the presentation. If you have technicalties with the webinar, you can contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. So we welcome you to introduce yourself, and you can do so by typing into the chat pane, which is located on your screen. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane, where you can type in your question. You can type in a question at any point during the presentations, and we'll address them at the conclusion of the webinar. An audio recording and the presentations will be posted to the Enlighten Initiative website after the webinar, and you can also ask additional questions from the Contact Us feature on our website. So we have an exciting agenda prepared for you today that's focused on the importance of the environmentally sound management of lighting products. Um, Michael Scholin from the United Nations Environment Program will provide information on the Enlighten Initiative's Efficient Lighting Toolkit, and David Bowie, Bowie from the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency will go into more detail about best practices. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short, informative overview of the Enlighten Initiative. Following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session and wrap up the discussion with closing remarks. So the Enlighten Initiative was established in 2009 to accelerate a global transformation to energy efficient lighting. We set a target date that by the end of 2016, so that's in just a few years, all countries should have either phased out inefficient incandescent lamps or at least have policies in place to phase out within an identified time frame. The initiative provides expert guidance, recommendation, and tools to assist developing and emerging countries to achieve a transition to efficient lighting. This includes the harmonization and promotion of minimum energy performance standards, also known as MEPs, and recommendations that include global best practices. Um, an important key initiative of the Enlighten Initiative is a global partnership program that provides technical advice and targeted research and support for the coordination of regional and national activities around the world. Forty-six countries have joined the partnership to date, and pilot workshops are currently underway in selected countries. Um, the Enlighten Initiative is a really excellent example of a successful private-public partnership and supported by the Global Environment Facility and with partners Philips Lighting, OSRAM, and the National Test Center, the National Lighting Test Center of China. So to, to achieve a, transi a transition following an integrated approach, which we promote, the initiative is providing key resources to countries, and here's some of them on the slide you see in front of you. Um, Enlighten has convened government representatives and international lighting experts from over 40 organizations to provide technical, policy, and capacity building support as part of our expert task forces. Country lighting assessments have been developed for over 100 countries and highlight the potential savings that can be realized by each country with a shift to efficient lighting in the residential, commercial, industrial, and outdoor lighting sectors for all lamp types. The Global Efficient Lighting Policy Map rates activity levels for four elements of the integrated policy approach in the residential sector and shows the readiness for countries to transition to efficient lighting. The Efficient Lighting Toolkit has been developed to communicate the benefits and tools necessary for the widespread adoption of efficient lighting. It's available as an ebook, and it's online uh, in the official UN languages. 
The Enlightened Learning Microsite, another tool, provides countries with expert advice, presentations, policy information, and technical resources. And NEW is a global policy dialogue which we are organizing to be convened in June of 2013, this year, to address lighting policy issues and the emergence of LEDs. Finally, the UNEP Collaborating Center in Beijing, China, is a partnership between UNEP and the National Lighting Test Center. It's an accredited facility that provides lighting testing training, advice quality control, and capacity building to support developing and emerging countries. So as you can see, the Enlightened Initiative provides a really wide range of support for all countries and stakeholders interested in a rapid transition to energy efficient lighting. So now I'd like to provide a brief introduction of our distinguished panelists. We're joined by our guest speaker, Mr. David Bowie, who is the Assistant Director of Lighting and Equipment Energy Efficiency in the Australian Government Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Quite a mouthful, but there's lots to back up David. He's an, he's an expert panelist, and he's responsible for the project management of a policy to phase out inefficient incandescent lighting in Australia, which has included oversight of the development of minimum energy performance standards, or MEPS, for incandescent and CFL lamps, and liaison with industry stakeholders and the public. He has also contributed to the development of regional initiatives for, to promote lighting, energy efficiency, and harmonization of standards, including the development of the Lights Asia Forum. He has over 20 years of experience in environmental policy and regulation in the Australian government. And then we have Mr. Michael Schoen, who's going to be our first speaker today, and he's a consultant for UNEP. Um, he's based in London, England, and provides technical expertise on market research to assist with forecasts of energy savings, electrical demand, and carbon emission reductions in developing and emerging countries. He has over 15 years of experience working on energy efficiency programs and policies. So now I'd like to pass the baton over to Michael, who will take over the webinar. And Michael, please go ahead. Great. Is that okay? All oh, right. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Scholand, and I work here at the UNEP Enlighten Initiative. And I'm going to take a quick look at one of the sections of the recently published Enlighten Toolkit, uh, which you can find on our website. And as Laura said, the toolkit is available as an ebook on our website in all of the official UN languages. Um, my overview is focused on section four of the toolkit, which is entitled Ensuring Product Availability and Conformance. And that title is really a pseudonym for Monitoring, Verification, and Enforcement, which is the title of my slide, uh, of my talk, <laughs> excuse me. So as we begin, um, let me put the, our topic for today in context. Now this is an illustration of the Enlighten Initiative's integrated policy approach. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, many people are familiar with MEPS, Minimum Energy Performance Standards. These are a legal tool for establishing performance levels that all products in the marketplace must meet. To help support MEPS in the market, we often see programs such as labeling and communications efforts to help consumers understand and adapt to that regulation. And these efforts we call supporting policies. And the third piece of the puzzle in the bottom left is our topic for today, monitoring verification and enforcement. Now, these activities are designed to ensure products in the marketplace conform to MEPS and that consumers receive good quality lamps and all the benefits associated with them. And finally, the last piece in the puzzle is environmentally sound management and these activities concentrate on safeguarding the environment and the health of people. They look at lamp production, usage, and end of life. And Lighten actually gave a webinar on this topic in December last year, and that webinar is available for download on the Enlightened Learning online portal. Okay, that sets the context, but why is mv &E important? Who benefits from an mv &E program? So this is a figure taken from Section 4 of the Enlightened Toolkit, and it shows that mv &E has distinct benefits for consumers, businesses, and policymakers. So for consumers, mv &E programs ensure that they receive the products they're expecting when they buy it. In, in other words, truth in labels, truth in advertising. For businesses, mv &E provides them with a level playing field, a fair market that encourages investment and technical, technological innovation. And for policymakers and government officials, it provides a tool to assess the effectiveness of policy measures, and it enables them to achieve key environmental and economic policy objectives. Now on the side here, I've just added a quote from, from Paolo Fallacini. He's a senior manager at CESED, the Appliance uh, Manufacturers Association here in Europe. And as a business representative, he understands the importance of a strong mv and &E program. And he notes here, quote, 
industry calls for effective market surveillance able to check the compliance of products placed on the market to declared energy efficiency values. Fair competition and fair compliance checking go hand in hand to enhance market transparency for the benefit of consumers. So, having established the importance and the benefits of an mv &E program, let's look at some of the possible objectives when creating a program. So some of the objectives we've listed here, uh, first one is to help ensure that energy efficiency policies are followed. Um, next would be to enable comparisons of cost, benefits, and effectiveness of programs. Then another objective would be to assess the negative impacts of non-compliant lighting on the marketplace. Then to ensure compliance with MEPS and the accuracy of labeling for consumers, as a consumer-focused objective. Then also to serve as a tool to eliminate non-compliant products from the market. To give consumers confidence when purchasing products, which leads to greater participation and faster market adoption. And then finally, each year, the rate of compliance can be tracked and thus calculation of savings and other benefits can be more accurately estimated. So fundamentally, MV&E activities are a continuous and complementary compliance efforts that work towards the goal of ensuring fair competition in the market. Now, let's take a deeper dive into the detail, starting with the definitions. So monitoring is sometimes called market surveillance. And this is a process used to check product performance by sampling products directly from the market. It, take, it involves taking consistent and accurate measurements using an agreed test method at a certified laboratory. It allows for the tracking of market trends and it gives a measure of success around those efficiency programs. Verification is also a product measurement or testing process, but it looks at the conformance declarations of manufacturers and importers and it verifies the accuracy of national regulatory requirements. So these tests are often carried out by third parties to ensure objectivity in the results. And enforcement, enforcement is the action taken by regulatory authorities against suppliers of non-compliant products. So enforcement relies on the transparent and rigorous monitoring and verification testing and investment in this effort yields high returns in terms of market and consumer protection. So what are the policies that need to be in place for a robust MV&E program? This slide gives an overview of some of the policy steps involved in creating a successful MV&E program. First, a clear rationale to explain the objectives of what's being established. Next, a legal entity needs to be identified and made responsible for those operations. Third, a, a program program entry conditions must be defined, including specifying which entities and what products are covered. Fourth, a policymaker will clarify the penalties for noncompliance, so everyone is aware upfront of the compliance uh, of the risks associated with noncompliance. Next, the program should be integrated with standards and labeling programs and the fees and the costs associated with testing should be published. And finally, a country should look to develop, strengthen, and partner with laboratories in their region to ensure rigorous and objective testing and to grow test laboratory capacity. Now let's look at a few slides of how mv &E is implemented by government. In order to bring lighting products to the market, over 80% of countries have some sort of compulsory entry condition for covered products. For example, in Canada, there's a requirement to have an energy efficiency verification mark on the product packaging. Korea requires access to inspect manufacturing facilities as part of their quality assurance process. And in Australia, we'll be hearing from David shortly, the government requires all regulated products to be registered if they're going to be offered on the market. So the majority of these programs rely on information provided by the suppliers to help determine coverage and compliance. And then finally, we note here that the product registration process is an inexpensive verification is, is an inexpensive verification of products in the market. Now let's just focus a little bit on monitoring the market surveillance aspect of MV&E. Let's take a look at the next slide. So market monitoring is important because it serves as a check that the products in the market are in compliance. Now this isn't just about store shelves, it includes online sales and phone and telephone sales. Market surveillance ensures compliance with legal program requirements in the country. Programs, sorry, products are sampled on a regular basis from the market, often from a few different major cities in the country to ensure that the sample of products gathered for testing are coming from different batches of the same model. And then finally, 
the market monitoring effects can be based around focusing on information accuracy in labels. They can also look at, at compliance with energy regulations, or they can also be driven on a complaint basis, such as when a competitor or a user finds a problem and reports it to the, re to the regulating authority. So once a sample is taken, it's time for testing, which brings me to the next slide. Testing capacity is an important aspect of an MV&E program. The demands for testing will increase with the market and with MV&E adoption. However, test laboratories require highly trained specialists and calibrated equipment, and this can be both expensive and time consuming. However, there are advantages to making this investment. Maintaining those national lab performance test results allows for comparison against international standards and can give a country assurance that they're receiving good quality lamps equivalent to others sold elsewhere in the world. And countries that test products can contribute data to share with other governments. So if a product is found to be problematic, then that information can be shared with others in a, in a region to help, to help them target their market monitoring efforts more effectively. Testing is intended to support manufacturers, to facilitate market access, and to protect consumers from poor quality products. We've noted on this slide five steps that a regulator should consider when doing when doing when helping develop testing capacity. The first is to adopt and harmonize with the international testing standards such as those from the IEC. Then encourage local laboratories to follow them and participate in and provide input to the development of international testing standards to coordinate testing and the calibration of testing equipment and finally to offer support and training to the industry. So within a regulatory program there is an option to have product testing and evaluation done by a government or it could be done by an independent third-party laboratory. So now, in looking into the accreditation process for laboratories, this includes regional bodies such as APLAC in Asia, as well as laboratories such as NV, sorry, NAVLAB in the US or NATA in Australia. Next, I just want to say a few words on enforcement. Enforcement is the penalty or punishment for companies who are caught out of compliance with the regulation. The type of response will vary on the situation, and, and a range of sanctions are available from simply writing a letter and informing them to imposing fines and even defamation of, of a brand. The type of program will also play a role in the type of response, whether it's the finding of noncompliance with a voluntary program or a mandatory or, or regulatory program. And the enforcement agency should have confidence in their test data on which to support their finding of noncompliance the target company would hopefully be willing to respond and to work with the authorities to correct the non-compliance finding. So s some of the civil and criminal sanctions that exist range from simply notifying them, as I said, to setting a correction period, and going all the way to delisting a company, imposing fines, and even publishing public notices that name and shame non-compliant companies. Now some of these penalties may sound harsh, but they are necessary to underwrite the whole market transformation program effort and in our work, speaking to various countries who have robust MV&E programs, enhancing compliance is highly cost-effective and critical to success. So please let me summarize my main points of my overview. First here is that low-quality lamps undermine the policy objectives in, in, a, in a market transformation program. MV &E, MEPS must have a stringent underpinning of MV&E to be successful. Success requires strong long-term commitment on the part of governments. Training and support for all players in the market are required at each implementation level. And then regional collaboration can provide benefits, including increased test capacity and cost savings, more laboratory facilities and capacity with special equipment, professional training for laboratory technicians and enforcement experts. And then here, MV&E effectiveness, it puts your market on the track to continual improvement. So finally, everything I've covered here today, as well as some of the some very interesting case studies and examples to make things tangible, can be found in Section 4 of the Energy Efficient Lighting Toolkit, which you can find on the Enlighten website. Now that's it, and I know it says questions at the top of my slide here, but I think our plan is to take questions at the end. So I'm going to hand over, oh yeah, so questions should be written into the questions box, and Laura's uh, taking those down now. And I'm going to hand over now to David Bowie, uh, from the Australian government to speak. Laura? Very much, and go ahead, David. Great. Uh, great. Um, thanks, Laura. Um, 
No, I think um, it's uh, to uh, show my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, just um, here we go. Sorry about that. I think that's. No, no, it's not. Yeah, it's it's good. Thank you, David. It's good? Yes, okay, it's good. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so um, thank you, um, Laura, and um, I'd like just like to thank um, the Enlightened Program for having me on the panel today. Um, so Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Compliance uh, activities uh, through the uh, Australian phase out of inefficient lighting and um, uh, uh, the um, introduction of um, performance requirements for compact fluorescent lamps. Um, okay. So, um, just as some background, uh, the Australian government uh, was one of the first countries to announce the phase out of inefficient incandescent lamps in uh, February 2007. Um, the actual phase out of the lamps uh, started in 2009 with an import restriction on tungsten filament lamps uh, uh, early in that year, tungsten filament GLS lamps early in that year. And um, then a point of sale uh, regulatory requirements came into place in late 2009 for a range of products and have continued to come into place in a, at a staged approach over the, over the next few years. Uh, we currently have uh, minimum energy performance standards and, and regulatory requirements for uh, a range of lighting related products including incandescent lamps, uh, tungsten filament and halogen, uh, integrated compact fluorescent lamps, linear fluorescent lamps, uh, ballasts for linear fluorescent lamps and uh, transformers and converters for halogen lamps. For incandescent lamps, which is the, the main focus we have on our phase out, um, we have requirements for uh, efficacy, uh, lumen maintenance and minimum lamp life. And then we have requirements for marking on packaging, including light output and lumens, wattage and watts and lamp lifetime. For compact fluorescent lamps, we have a broader range of performance requirements, including start-up time, run-up time, uh, premature lamp failure, lamp life and switching withstand uh, as well as mercury content. And the reason why we have a broader range there is because we're proposing to people that, and we have removed certain products from the marketplace in Australia. You can't buy certain tungsten filament lamps anymore. And so we're, we're putting this uh, broader range of requirements on compact fluorescent lamps to ensure that they remain a viable alternative for the inefficient in, uh, incandescent lamps that are being phased out. Now, in Australia, we um, have uh, a regulation which applies to uh, electrical appliance energy efficiency, and it's developed cooperatively amongst uh, the two top levels of government in Australia, the states, territories, and the Commonwealth government. And we also cooperate with the New Zealand government. Um, our Equipment Energy Efficiency Program is a joint program between the, the Australian Commonwealth government, the Australian states and territories, and the New Zealand government. In the case of lighting, New Zealanders haven't actually uh, uh, met, had a mandatory phase out of inefficient incandescent lamps, but they do have uh, the same maps as we do for, um, for compact fluorescent lamps. Uh, most recently, we've had some changes to our regulation. We brought into effect the Greenhouse and Energy Minimum Standards uh, Act in October 2012, so that's quite new for us, and that's created a national framework for the implementation of our Appliance Energy Efficiency Program, and it replaces seven different overlapping pieces of state legislation that we used to work through. Uh, so we hope that will be a little easier for, uh, for the industry to, to comply now. Now, monitoring uh, uh, is, is a key part. Monitoring and compliance is a key part of our of our um, appliance energy efficiency program, and particularly the lighting phase out. And we think it's important to understand the market, uh, the products in the market, and and what's happening within the market. Um, and there's several different information sources that we use in Australia. So in Australia, if, if a product, um, whether it be a light bulb or a refrigerator or an air conditioner, is subject to um, MEPS regulation, um, that you must register the product before you can sell it. 
um, and that means that we get information um, when products enter the market. So we, we know how many products uh, are registered to be sold in the market, we know the number of suppliers that are, are legally participating in the market, and for each product that's registered we require that test data be submitted and sometimes sometimes the actual test, test certificates itself. So we actually have data on all of the different parameters that are being regulated. We also use import data. Now with lighting in particular in Australia, we don't make many light bulbs in Australia. We, um, there are some people who assemble LEDs and there are some people who manufacture uh, luminaires, but in terms of incandescent lamps, linear fluorescent lamps and compact fluorescent lamps, uh, there are none made in Australia. So import data is, a, is actually a really good indicator to us of the number of products being bought in to be sold in Australia. Uh, we also, under the, the new GEMS legislation, we have a new requirement for, that uh, for people registering products to be sold into Australia can be required to submit annual data on sales and import-export of each registered model uh, and uh, submit that to the regulator. Now that's a new requirement, so we actually haven't been receiving that information yet, but in the future I think that's going to be very useful for us to monitor uh, the market um, in Australia of, um, of regulated products. Um, in some cases you can also have retail sales data that third parties collect. Um, now in Australia that's not available for lighting, but it is for products like refrigerators that we also regulate, so that can be quite useful as well. Um, and as part of our phase out in 2011, we carried out what we call the Household Intrusive Survey, where we went into 150 homes in three cities across Australia, uh, with the permission of the people who own the home, and um, we counted over 7,000 lamps. People went in, they counted all the lamps that are in the sockets in those houses. Where possible, um, they identified what type of lamp it was, and they also noted what type of room it was in, whether it was a living room, a kitchen or a bedroom, a bathroom, and um, the, at the same time the householders were given a written survey um, to fill out uh, which collected information on, that, on the, the hours of use for those lights as well. So that gave us a, a good sort of, um, uh, uh, a sort of uh, small, smaller scale um, view of, of how these lamps that were being sold were actually being used in the household. And then of course we actually have the information we collect from benchmarking and compliance testing. So why do we think monitoring compliance is important? Well I think some of this overlaps what Michael said before, but um, the fact that you're actually carrying out monitoring compliance as part of um, your appliance energy efficiency program um, discourages people from trying to sell non-compliant products. And that's particularly the case if you require them to register the products up front and submit test data because it means up front they're going to have to make a decision about whether they're, they're going to be complying with the rules. Um, and that's going to discourage a lot of people from, um, for, for, from not complying. For, um, for, for good manufacturers of quality products and, and, and suppliers of quality products, it's going to give them the confidence to actually bring those quality products into your marketplace because they can have a greater level of confidence that they won't be competing against a big range of non-compliant products, um, particularly potentially non-compliant products that are cheaper than quality products. Um, it can also increase consumer confidence um, in the promoted energy efficiency lamps. And this is, we had this issue with compact fluorescent lamps, there had been a, a history of, um, of people that had some bad experience with, with uh, earlier compact fluorescent lamp products and, um, and the fact that we were putting in minimum performance levels and actually carrying out compliance activities can help increase consumer confidence in, in trying, trying the energy efficiency and energy efficient lamps. Uh, the collection of uh, monitoring data can also help you in the future when you go to review your, your MEPS levels um, or, or your labelling requirements. Um, and it basically can mean you have, you have a good idea of the range of, um, of performance levels in the market and whether you can uh, tighten up those MEPS levels or those, or those labelling levels um, to actually uh, further improve your energy efficiency gains. Um, and it may encourage uh, manufacturers to be more accepting of more stringent requirements, MEPS requirements, if they're confident that you're actually going to be enforcing the levels uh, rather than just asking them to, to comply with them but, but not doing anything about it if, if, if someone else isn't complying. 
This is just a, a diagram of, um, of how things have been going in Australia. Um, this is from our uh, import data that uh, is from the Australian Customs Service via the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, and I've got three types of lamps here. The, um, the, blue, the blue line here is um, as uh, the main, uh, the um, incandescent lamps, the uh, tons of filament general lighting service lamps that were being that are phased out, um, and you can see here that um, in um, that by um, <coughs> 2009 um, there really were very low sales coming from at quite a high peak. Um, the sales have dropped markedly. There are still some categories, uh, some special purpose exemptions that are still allowed to be sold. Uh, unfortunately, our data source there um, had ended in the end of 2011. Uh, the customs people stopped collecting that data. Um, the other two products there we have are the, um, the compact fluorescent lamps. And um, you can actually see, interestingly enough, in 2007, when um, when the minister um, actually announced the phase out, there was actually a, a peak in in import and consumption there. Uh, people thought they'd have have a try of the uh, the lamps that were being discussed, um, and then they've still stayed a major player in um, in domestic uh, in residential lighting uh, since then. Um, and then the green lamp, the green uh, line is uh, main voltage halogen lamps. Uh, they basically uh, they look the same as the pear shaped GLS lamps, except that rather than a tungsten filament, they have a halogen capsule inside them, um, and they uh, just meet the minimum performance requirements and basically present themselves as a as an efficient alternative, but less efficient than CFLs. Um, uh, for people who maybe uh, don't like CFLs, uh, aren't willing to use them, or in some cases have dimming circuits or motion centers, sensors that may not be compatible with a lot of CFLs. So the phase out results. Um, analysis of our input data and the household survey uh, indicate that quite a lot is being achieved in terms of energy efficiency. There's been a big uptake in the residential stock of CFLs. Um, and uh, particularly noting, of course, that CFLs last longer than, than incandescent lamps or halogens. So they've taken a, a fairly big market share. Um, and it's also led to savings, both in terms of um, greenhouse gases, of approximately uh, 2 million tonnes per annum, we estimate, and also consumer energy savings of approximately 400 million a year. Um, and I just note that these savings um, should be attributed to both the phase out policy, but also other activities that state governments have taken in Australia, such as um, lamp replacement schemes. So um, with um, with this uptake, with with the results, as I think I said, we've had a, a good uptake of CFLs, but we need to keep an eye. The data is showing we need to keep an eye on these mains voltage halogens and um, take take their use into consideration in any future revisions of our regulatory requirements, and also in consumer education. With um, with the benchmarking um, and compliance testing activity, um, we've ca we've carried out a, a number of um, number of different steps there. We actually started with our benchmarking testing in 2008, so that was before the actual um, the, the actual regulations came into effect in 2009. We purchased uh, about 96 different CFL products, uh, you know, sample various sa samples of each, 10 to 20 samples of each, um, and we tested those in order to establish a baseline understanding of the performance of compact fluorescent lamps in the Australian marketplace uh, before we actually brought any uh, regulatory requirements uh, into effect. Um, then uh, th I just note that this is actually part of a broader program of benchmarking that uh, occurred at that time in a number of other countries in the Asia region. And we took those results and we compared the test results uh, to the limits that were proposed for the Australian MEPS to be regulated and to a number of other um, uh, performance schemes that were around ELI, the Efficient Lighting Initiative, U the US Energy Star and the UK Energy Savings Trust. And that allowed us to um, uh, in advance evaluate our proposal for MEPS in Australia, which helped us get through the various approvals processes that we had to undertake, uh, government approvals processes, before we could put those regulations in place. Then in 2010, uh, once uh, pretty much I think about five months after the MEPS came in, in late 2009, uh, we went and bought another 170 CFL products. 
um, and um, and we've been having those tested. It actually took us a little while to get them tested and if you remember um, for lifetime testing of CFLs it, it takes a while for our minimum lifetime testing. It, uh, 6,000 hours it takes about over nine months um, so our first step with with that um, with that benchmarking and uh, for compliance purposes we checked whether those products were registered and if they were not registered we contacted the supplier to uh, to request that those products be registered and reminded them that the MEPS have, regulations had come into effect um, the test results we, we received them last year and they're currently being analyzed um, when we have all the results analyzed we'll be compact contacting suppliers of uh, non-compliant products to inform them that their uh, product is non-compliant. Because it was um, fairly early on in the MEPS, process, in the MEPS uh, process, it may be that some of those products were brought into Australia before the MEPS uh, was regulated, um, in which case they weren't necessarily breaking the, the law. Um, but we'll still be telling them um, for future reference. Um, certainly, uh, if they're still bringing those products in, they, they will be making them aware that, that they're not compliant. Uh, it also helped us uh, iron out issues with um, with how the, the test labs we were using were um, were reporting the test results uh, and sort of um, uh, coming up with uh, tables and, and reporting results that that helped us in terms of evaluating whether the lamps were um, were meeting the regulatory requirements. So this year we're going to be doing another lot of benchmarking and compliance. We're going to be uh, undertaking a store survey um, and we'll be focusing this time both on incandescent lamps, um, particularly the halogen lamps that remain in the marketplace, and on compact fluorescent lamps and also linear fluorescent lamps. Um, so we'll be, look, we'll be sending people into stores to do a store survey and they'll be looking at whether the products on, on the store shelves uh, are actually complying with uh, product registration requirements, uh, whether they're uh, complying with packaging marking requirements, and they'll be buy they'll have a shopping list and they'll have to buy uh, some samples of uh, incandescent lamps to be tested from different uh, categories of incandescent lamps, and also we're we're hoping to also buy a further uh, 100, 100 CFL uh, product models, um, of course, uh, yeah, 10, 10 to 20 samples of each um, for further testing of CFLs as well. So just to give an interview, so we, we've had several steps here. Uh, we have the 2008 uh, pre-regulation benchmarking to give us a, a, a snapshot of the market and also to put the market in a regional context. Uh, 2010, an initial valuation of the impact of regulation. Uh, 2011, the intrusive survey um, to link the market level data to use of products in the home. And now in 2013, we're going to be saying, well, well how is our phase out going three to four years on? So just, um, I may not go into this in a lot of detail because I know we don't have a lot of time, but these are just some points if you're thinking about store surveys. They're probably a little bit more complicated than they first seem. That's what, um, what we found. But you're, it's important to, train, to um, train the staff that are going to do the survey, get them to practice in stores before they do the real thing. Make sure they understand their rights and responsibilities in carrying out the survey. Um, we've actually developed software um, uh, that can be used on PDAs or, or smartphones in store to check in store whether um, to access our registration database to check in store whether the products are actually registered and that helps them work out which ones they need to collect the information on in terms of non-registered products. Um, we will we uh, survey a range of different types of stores, supermarkets, hardware stores, discount stores and specialist lighting stores. And the survey will occur in, um, I think, at least three different cities in Australia. And we, we intend that when we purchase a, a product for testing, the product sample, 10 to, to 20 lamps, will, we hope will be purchased from more than one store in more than one city to try and access different uh, production batches for, for the test, the compliance testing. Um, they may also photograph product packages for uh, later identification. Um, it's also important when you're doing any type of compliance testing to make sure that you have access to accredited test labs. Now, the Australian we actually don't use Australian government test labs for this activity. We use accredited test labs, though, and they may be in Australia or they may be overseas. Um, uh, but we, you need to make sure that they're accredited and uh, follow whatever uh, regulatory policy that, that you have for those requirements and also make sure that they're available to carry out the compliance testing within a, within, um, a set time frame, come to agreement with, 
with them about how long they're going to take for testing because I think it's um, I think it's important to try and get the results out as soon as possible um, because I think you're probably aware that um, products change in the market. So if, if you end up um, having results about non-compliance, you really want to um, go back to the suppliers and manufacturers while that product is still in the marketplace and, and take any uh, compliance action that, that's necessary. Um, you want to agree um, with the test labs about how they're going to apply uh, test and other tolerances before the testing commences. And um, you want to make sure that um, you actually have access to the technical expertise, to technical experts who understand the products, understand the standards you're applying um, in your regulation and understand the test methodology. Um, so, so you have access to, to that information as you go go through this process and that may be someone in-house or it may be a consultant you, you retain for, for that expertise. Certainly um, in Australia we have a, a team of um, uh, public servants like myself but also um, technical experts who, um, to, who are consultants who, who help us with all of this work. Now, um, we also, apart from store surveys, there are other reasons why you may undertake compliance testing. Um, that could be if we're looking at the, the number of products that are being registered in a certain category and notice that suppliers may not be registering products in a certain category. That might cause us to uh, go out and see what's on the shelves, uh, contact uh, suppliers who are, haven't registered their products, potentially test some of them as well. Um, if there's something that looks, looks a bit odd with the registration information we receive, um, we may test the products. Um, if there's a previous history of non-compliance by the supplier, by the manufacturer, or even by the, uh, the test lab um, who, um, who has been used to provide the test data for the registration, that may cause us to be more likely to, to select that product for testing. Um, unlikely test claims, inconsistent test claims. Um, sometimes uh, suppliers or, or other people in, in the lighting industry or, or the other appliance industry might actually uh, uh, sort of bring out bring to our attention possibly uh, non-compliant products that are, that are available in the marketplace and we'll consider acting on that and also complaints from consumers or from consumer affairs organisations. Um, so registry, uh, if you're going to have a registration, uh, a MEP scheme requiring product registration particularly, um, it's important to think about who needs to know about that in advance. Um, so uh, for Australia, if we, because we uh, don't make light bulbs, it was important to let uh, the manufacturers in other countries who make like bulbs that are sold in Australia, to let them know when our MEP scheme was going to come into effect so that um, they could uh, manufacture compliant products in time. It's important to let consumers know when you're bringing regulations into effect and to help educate them um, not only about when the regulation or the labelling is going to come into effect, um, but also to guide them about how to select um, uh, from the new products that are going to be available, particularly if you're going to be removing products they're familiar with from the marketplace. Uh, we certainly had a, a point of sale education scheme back in 2009. And it's important to let suppliers know in advance, uh, particularly if you consider CFLs can take say 10 months to test, so you need to give them time to source compliant products and have them tested um, so that they can uh, present that test information uh, to, for registration on time and also to help um, the suppliers and also retailers uh, clear non-compliant stock um, from the stores. Um, once you've done your um, compliance testing, you, also, you should also think about your policy about what you're going to do with uh, the test results um, when you've done compliance testing. Um, so you need to consider what, uh, whether you have any legislative requirements about privacy um, of, of the results. But in any case, um, establish a consistent policy about um, what information you will announce if you do some compliance testing and come up with a non-compliant result. Who will you tell? Um, be consistent about that. Um, whether or not you can talk about particular cases, at least publishing uh, uh, news, letting consumers and, and suppliers and the media know that you're undertaking compliance activity is important to, to show that compliance is actually an integral part of your, um, of your MEPS uh, or labelling program. Um, if you're not actually going to be publicly uh, identify suppliers, you could release uh, tables of anonymous data about products and then supply that give the suppliers themselves a key 
to allow them to identify their own products in the table. And that's what we did back in 2008 before we actually had a regulation in force. Um, we actually published the, uh, the benchmarking data anonymously but I uh, gave the, the particular suppliers keys so they could work out which ones were their products in, in those tables. Um, you could also, I think as Michael mentioned, you could consider um, making arrangements to share and explain compli uh, exchange compliant results with other countries um, that also have similar lighting energy efficiency um, requirements. Um, and this means you can um, pool your resources as different countries can pool their resources on compliance. Um, it can help uh, focus your compliance activities if you know uh, the outcomes of, um, of, of test results that, that other, um, other countries have conducted, particularly if you're um, using similar or harmonised standards. Um, and you should also think about how, how you're going to um, store your compliance data, have a secure and reliable database, um, because this, this information is important not just for um, the compliance activity itself, but for future uh, reporting on your MEPS or labelling program and future revisions of your programs. Um, the, other, the other important thing, and something we have in Australia, are uh, penalty provisions. So if you have a non-compliant product, um, actually having penalty provisions in your regulations is important. The Australian GEMS regulator has the power to issue infringement notices or uh, they can ask businesses to compensate consumers for, uh, for losses if, um, if the product is non-compliant and for more serious breaches um, they can go to the court to ask to impose financial penalties. Uh, and we certainly uh, find, um, I think as Michael mentioned, that the publication of non-compliance uh, can be a big incentive um, for suppliers and manufacturers to, um, to comply. Um, they don't like that type of news coming out of, about their products and uh, work, work hard to avoid that. Um, it's also an option there to consider working with uh, community consumer organisations. So in Australia we have a community consumer organisation who also does product testing. And also um, in terms of compliance activities and enforcement activities, if you have a consumer affairs regulator, as we do in Australia, to work with them as well. So LED um, testing, now I'm going to have to go through this fairly quickly, I think. Um, we don't have uh, reach requirements for energy efficiency for LEDs at the moment, but we're looking at what we need to do in that sphere. Um, we, as I think a lot of other people, um, and a lot of other countries see LED lighting as the potential to broaden the range of energy efficient lighting products available to consumers. Um, but we're also aware there's a wide variation of quality of LED products currently in the marketplace. And it's that variation of quality and also um, in, um, incorrect claims of performance in the marketplace that could have the, uh, the potential to uh, cause negative consumer perception and therefore a reduced uh, level of uptake of LEDs as an energy efficient option in the future. So to date we've tested about 80 LED products both from Australia and overseas with the intention of um, understanding the quality and efficacy of products currently available to consumers. Um, so basically experiment and see how well the currently available test methods for LEDs work um, and also then to help us evaluate and um, the need for and develop approaches to regulation of LED lamps in Australia. We'll still be, soon be issuing what we call a product profile about LED lighting in Australia. So our test results to date have um, shown there's a significant variation in the quality of LEDs available in the marketplace. Um, this is um, a, a, um, a graph of, of the products we've tested, um, both in the red is 2010 and the blue is 2012 um, in terms of the, the luminous flux output of, of, the, of the products. Um, and you can see there's a very, fairly wide variation there in, in, the, um, in the efficacy and light output of the products. Um, I'll leave you to, to have a look at that, although you can see that um, between the 2010 and 2012 samples there has been overall an improvement in the quality of the products in terms of efficiency and light output. Um, this um, graph here actually shows the difference between uh, claim values of a product, what the supplier is claiming the product does and, and what it actually does. So you can have some examples here where you, you have someone is, is, um, is claiming a um, their, their LED lamp is, is putting out um, between 900 and 1,000 lumens, something equivalent to a 75 watt halogen, and instead if the consumer actually purchases that lamp and plug, plugs it in, 
from our testing, you're going to find that they're actually only putting out about 400 lumens, which is something even a non-educated consumer has a good chance of noticing. Um, and that's sort of uh, barely equivalent to a 40 watt halogen. Um, so that's sort of a, an area where you have uh, potentially um, uh, uh, consumers that are going to be disappointed with the products they, they claim. Again here there's um, a few examples of products where there are actually equivalency claims made on the product packaging. In this case uh, we have a lot of MR16 uh, small halogen downlights uh, which on average a 50 watt halogen downlight is about 710 lumens and you can see some products have been saying well we're the product is equivalent with um, with that 50, 50 watt halogen download, and instead that was putting out um, a lot less lot less light output here, you know, 200 to to 300 lumens. So just uh, to to summarise um, the points I made in the presentation, um, it's important if you're going to uh, have a regulated minimum energy performance uh, requirements or a labelling program, that before you commence uh, and before you finalise designing your program, that you understand the products in your marketplace. Um, that you um, that when you are planning your program and planning your budget, that you do include um, costs for monitoring and data collection as part of, re of your regulatory program. Um, include that in your overall budget right at the start. Um, when you ca carry out uh, monitoring and chest testing, it, it has to be a central part of your program and a, and a visible part of your program in order to boost stakeholder confidence. Um, make sure that you um, have technical skills accessible um, to, to help you with your, um, with your monitoring and compliance activities. Um, use surveys and make sure that you have uh, test capacity available to support your program. Um, and in terms of monitoring compliance, it's important to plan ahead. Um, these can be com complex activities and they can take some quite, quite some time from start to finish and involve a number of parties. So, so it's important to actually plan, plan those, um, plan all the different steps. And at the end of the day, um, communicate your actions and results because that's, um, that's how you're going to um, get, get the best, best outcomes from your monitoring compliance. So that's uh, the end of my program. Thank you for listening. Um, I've just put a couple of websites here for further information on um, on the Australian Government uh, Lighting Energy Efficiency Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was excellent. And thank you also to Mike for your outstanding presentations. Really interesting today. So we've had some great questions from uh, from the audience. And uh, we'll use the remaining time to answer and discuss these questions. Okay, so the first question is, um, yes, okay, hang on a second. The first question is, I'm going to address to Mike, and it's, will UNEP enforce a globally applicable quality label? I know, I know I can. Go ahead, Mike, one moment. I'm going to unmute you so you can answer. Thank you, Laura. So, no, I, the simple answer here is no, the, the, the UN is not uh, enforcing or, or developing a globally applicable, excuse me, quality label. Um, the UN rather is offering technical support and guidance uh, to the partner countries that we're working with. And, and then each country determines what policies and legislation it will adopt. And you know, generally, labels can be very country, you know, can be country specific. There are cultural and, and language issues that need to be taken into account because you want to make sure the labels communicating as clear as possible to consumers. But we do find that in some regions of the world, countries agree to share a common or harmonized label. And a great example of that is is what's done here in Europe, um, where we have 27 countries and and three. European Economic Area countries that are all using the uh, the European uh, energy label, the, the A to G scale. So, so you can find regional agreements, um, but generally uh, labels will be country specific. But it, but that's not uh, something the UN is is advocating a one one global label. Thanks so much, Mike. And um, I have a question here that I'm going to pass off to David or ask him to answer. And that is, what is the financing source of monitoring and verification? 
Oh, in, in Australian program, well, um, our our, um, our overall um, equipment energy efficiency program is uh, jointly funded by by the um, the Commonwealth government, the uh, the state governments, and and the New Zealand government also contributes. But because we have um, upfront registration requirements, uh, there is a registration fee, and so that registration fee also contributes to to our overall budget, in, uh, and including um, that registration fee also um, helps with the monitoring. And, uh, and compliance costs. So that's one of the advantages of having upfront registration in your program. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, David. Um, and there's a two-part question now that I'd like to pass over to Mike. And the first part is, um, what is the relationship between energy efficiency and mon mercury content in a CFL? And the second part of that is that um, it says we have wattage, actual and rated wattage, and mercury content per unit of CFL that is known. How can we calculate the energy efficiency of the CFL? So, Mike, I'm going to pass that over to you. Great. Thank you, Laura. So, um, well, thank you for these questions. I, I, I think the relation, um, mercury vapor is, is necessary inside the fluorescent lamp, whether it's a compact fluorescent or linear fluorescent, to allow uh, the lamp to operate. Um, but there really are uh, many other design factors uh, in, in, a fluorescent, in fluorescent technology that have a much greater impact on, on the efficacy of the lamp. And, and just on, on, on the second part of this um, uh, question about efficacy, uh, or efficiency rather, I want to clarify between the terms efficacy and efficiency. So, so efficiency is used in, in many products and, and it's a unitless dimension. You know, if you have watts divided by watts, then you can be efficiency. But if you, but efficacy is lumens per watt. Efficacy is used because you're, it's not a unitless dimension. You're, you've got lumens, which you're measuring, that's the light output of the product, and then you're dividing that by watts, which is the energy input. So when you have a ratio of two different um, things that you're measuring, lumens and, and watts of energy, uh, you can't call it efficiency, so they use the term efficacy. I, I think the best thing is to, to have a look in the glossary of terms uh, in the toolkit where these things are defined uh, quite clearly, and um, um, I think that's, that's it, yeah. Hey, thank you so much. So at this time, um, we'll address any other, any further questions um, with email. So be sure that your questions will be answered. But I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the Enlighten Initiative and thank our speakers for uh, participating in today's webinar. Um, we've had a terrific audience, and we really, really appreciate your time. I invite the attendees of our webinar to check out the Enlightened website over the next few weeks if you'd like to view the slides and listen to an actual recording of today's presentations. And please note that if your country is not already a member of the Global Efficient Lighting Partnership, we encourage you to join. We also offer expert policy assistance and the ability for you to subscribe to our e-newsletter and participate in future webinars. So have a wonderful day, and we hope to see you again at upcoming Enlighten events. And this concludes our webinar.